everybody. Thanks for tuning in for another edition of Live with Lenny. This is Zach Dittmars, Fish Talk Production Manager, Art Director, as Lenny would say, local kayak Sharpie. Um, thanks for tuning in. Um, in place for Chris Charbonneau. He is on vacation. Actually, he's at dinner, but that's okay. I'd like to mention that uh, tonight's episode is presented by Curtis Stokes. Um, if you're in the market for a hot new fish boat, new to you, um, you can visit curtisstokes.net to look at their full inventory. Um, if you're picking up a Fish Talk magazine, like our latest issue here, flip to the back cover for the featured boats from Curtis Stokes. And if you flip into our brokerage and classified section, you'll get more details on some of those boats. And if you're not in front of, uh, got a magazine in front of you, go to our website, fishtalkmag.com and check out the broker listings at this URL here. So um, again, just like to thank our sponsor Curtis Stokes and um, without further ado I'm going to bring on Lenny and tonight we're going to target ta discuss targeting cutlass fish also known as ribbon fish also known as belt fish on the Chesapeake Bay. So without further ado our angler in chief Lenny Rudeau. Hey, Lenny, hey we're out, Zach. You know just living the dream. It, it seems weird not having Chris on the other end it just seems strange. Yeah, I know he's, he's been your sidekick for the past year or so. So, uh, you know, I'll do my best. Well, I know you fish more than he does. So that gives you a leg up right there. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I haven't fished a lot this summer. We're doing a lot of crabbing. So, you know, it's been great crabbing out there. Crabbing's fun. It's crabbing great. from a kayak? That's right. Kayak crabbing. You know it. W w trout line or pull traps? A little bit of both. Wow. I don't know how you pull that off. Well, stay tuned. There might be an article, an upcoming fish talk, maybe a little video component to go along with it. Ooh, I like that. I like that. Let me, I got to ask you one question. What do you do when a crab starts scrambling around by your feet in a kayak? You, you grab it by the back fin. Have they gotten you yet? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, let's start talking cutlass fish. Because I get very excited by this. Very excited. And here's why. Uh, it's really a new visitor to our waters, right? I mean, who heard about cutlass fish being in Maryland waters in the Chesapeake Bay? Virginia, they've always had them to some extent. But the last couple of years, they've had a ton of them. And they've even started coming up to Maryland. So, I mean, whether you're a Virginia guy or a Maryland guy, this is kind of cool, right? Totally new species to go after. It does taste good. I did cook up a bunch. And I got to say, let's put up slide number one, because I got to give full credit here to our contributor, Eric Packard. Now, Eric is another kayak guy. And he's been telling me for a couple years running now, he's been catching these cutlass fish on his kayak in the Patuxent River. And I'm like, man, that is cool. I've got to get in on this. So not knowing what the heck I was doing, I joined Eric for a day. I hopped in the car. I ran down there. He put me in one of his kayaks and we went out and this is the net result cutlass fish like this not real big ones the guys down in virginia uh especially if they go into the ocean tend to get them a little bigger they're getting some on the wrecks out of ocean city right now they tend to be a little bigger significantly bigger sometimes uh but these are you know these are solid fish it's pretty dang cool go to the next slide zach will you here it comes here it is people ready my first ever Cutlass fish in the Chesapeake Bay. I was just ecstatic when I brought this fish into the boat. And I tell you, it's a really interesting fight. It's a very different fight because they swim backwards. They kind of undulate their body and swim backwards. So you feel the hit. You set the hook. It feels like you set the hook into a brick wall. <laughs> I saw that comment pop up real fast. It feels like you set the hook into a brick wall. And then when you start reeling, if the fish is just swimming straight towards you, you know, or, or even just not swimming, you don't feel a darn thing. Like you think it's gone. And then the next moment you feel this tug, tug, tug as it tries to swim backwards. And then you reel some more and it feels like there's nothing there. And then you feel this tug, tug, tug. And then you get them up near the surface and they go nuts. It is a lot of fun. Pretty darn cool. So before we go to the next slide, I should have said right off the bat, um, I, I was thrown out of kilter because it was Zach, not Chris speaking. Uh, everybody, if you have any questions, pop them right into the comments. Zach will put them up on screen. We'll address them immediately. 
Uh, we like questions. That's why we do this live. We, we, you know, it gives us a chance to interact. And and if you ask a question tonight, your name will go into a hat. And you know what will happen next. You might win a prize. We have today a copy of Hook, Line, and Slinker by author Wayne Young that uh, is going to go to some lucky question asker. Your name will go into the hat. Zach will pick it at the end. And you can win a Hook, Line, and Slinker. And if you read Fish Talk, you already know that Wayne does a tremendous job detailing wrecks and reefs. And uh, this one is all about wrecks in the bay and around the bay. And it's pretty fascinating stuff because you learn with every, every wreck that he details, you learn not only where it sits and how to fish it, but also a little bit of the history behind it. So it really is quite fascinating. I, I really enjoy his stuff. And if you read Fish Talk, I'm betting you do too. All right, take me over to the next slide, please. So here's one of the interesting things. Um, you might think that to try and catch these cutlass fish, you have to go somewhere crazy. And it's totally not that way. Um, they are in channels. They're in flats, hovering over flats. Uh, they're not at all structure-oriented fish. But one of the interesting things is that means you can take a kayak and not go very far and you can catch them. And uh, in fact, I've heard of... I uh, Zach will correct me on this if I'm wrong, but I think we're up to five from the Severn already. Um, some guys have been catching them around Chesapeake Beach. They're in the chop tank. They were in the chop tank last year, too. Um, but, you know, they're, they're pretty close to home. Uh, not structure oriented. So you're not going and looking for, say, riprap or, you know, necessarily casting to piers and pilings. You're looking for those uh, flat areas where we found them was 10, 12 feet of water. Um, and they were down near bottom, although Eric said that he often gets them up near the top. They do sit like this. You can find videos of them on YouTube. They sit like this with their head pointing up and they feed up. But uh, certainly last weekend, we did our best by far by casting out, letting our lure sink down to the bottom, and then slowly and steadily retrieving it. Not a lot of action. A lot of action did not seem to entice them one little bit. They just wanted that slow, steady retrieve just off the bottom. And we have a special treat tonight, people. We're going to try something new. I hope we do not have a technological disaster. If we do, hey, no big deal. We can just blame Zach, right? Uh, Zach, why don't you roll our video? Let's see the video. We're going to see if this works. Cross your fingers, people. So what I wanted to show you here is you're going to see a lot of oh, – Missed one there. Ready? Real, 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 real. Oh, missed another one. You miss these fish a lot. It takes a lot of misses. About the cutlass fish. If you're fishing plastics, bring plenty because you end up with a whole lot of this. They love to bite those tails off. Here he comes, my first cutlass fish. It's so exciting. Serious teeth on these guys. Serious teeth. Whoop. Sorry. Uh, yeah, so a couple takeaways from that quick little video clip. And by the way, that is going to be made into a bigger video that will be on Fish Talk's YouTube channel. If you haven't subscribed to it, visit YouTube, put Fish Talk Magazine into the search bar, click on subscribe, and uh, you won't miss any of our upcoming videos. We, we do put out a fair number. Um, all how-to, where-to, fishing stuff, and boat reviews. So if you're interested, click on subscribe. Uh, but as I mentioned while that was running, first thing is you miss a lot of hits. You're going to feel two, three, four, five hits before you ever hook one. Um, that's normal. Don't be worried by that. Um, I'm not exactly sure how these fish feed, but they seem to kind of come up and nip at the bait once or twice. Um, and they have really strange mouths, as you saw, with really big teeth. And they just seem to miss the hook quite a bit. So what does this lead us to? Zach, can you put up the next slide, please? Because, whoop. Sure thing. Sure thing. Um, just um, going back a few minutes, you had asked about uh, Severn. And uh, I'd like to Ooh. hear this comment from Steve. 
that he caught four in the seven in the last two weeks. So in addition, that's, you know, we're approaching 10 plus from all our different reports. Nice. That is very cool. And congrats, Steve. I mean, that's pretty wild catching these things in the seven. How about that? All right. And uh, I got a question from one here, and I think it's going to tie into your next slide. So I'm going to put that up as I put the next slide up and I'm going to disappear. Perfect. Artificially live bait. Okay. Well, we're going to get right into that. Um, artificial artificial uh, is what we were using. And most of the talk I hear, even from the guys in Virginia who, who've, you know, kind of always had them around, it's mostly a lure gig. Uh, that, certain that doesn't mean you can't catch them on bait. In fact, when I cleaned them, um, one of them, only one had anything in its belly. And he had a spot in his belly, about a maybe a three-inch spot. And the interesting thing was, again, you saw those teeth, the spot was in three distinct segments. There was a head, there was a middle, and there was a tail section. And you could just tell that that cutlass fish had just chomped him into three pieces and eaten them one at a time. Now, you can see this lure. Zach, can you make that big? I don't know if – I know I'm throwing you into the fire here, but yeah, thank you. you it, it, hopefully you can see not only is the tail missing here, but we're also chopped up in the body. Um, Go ahead and take me back, Zach. Get me back here. And I'm going to show for see. This is the tackle box, same tackle box that I have. And if I open it right now, I can show you the empty bag. I went through an entire bag. Um, I was using the pumpkin seed with a chartreuse tail. I had some whites, uh, which have been highly effective on just about every other species I've been going for lately, specs, rock, whatever. Um, they, they wanted the pumpkin seed with a chartreuse tail. Uh, Eric was pitching a uh, electric chicken to great effect. They liked that. So maybe having a little dark in that plastic helped. I don't know. But uh, the, the plastics were what they were going for. Now, uh, go ahead and put up the next slide, which is that because I have here in the box some of the other stuff I use. And it's all kind of a tangled mess right now. There we go. Come on now. I was using a spoon at one point, and up oh, there he is. There's the rattle trap. I thought for sure this thing was going to do the trick. I really did. Um, that mimics a little bait fish tremendously. They can't bite through it. Uh, didn't do it. I never caught a fish on the rattle trap. Uh, I had a couple hits on the spoon, but I never actually landed a fish. Um, I, I did, and, and here, why didn't you use metal jigs? And we'll get into cooking and taste in just a minute. Stay tuned for that part. We got a special slide for that. Uh, the, the metal, like I say, it got hit, but I wasn't catching fish on it. I didn't hook up, so I went back to the plastic. I had two rods. I, I threw it quite a while. I threw a goldie. Um, didn't do it. It just didn't do it. I can't tell you exactly why, um, but it wasn't happening. Now, that said, uh, Zach, let's go to the next slide here, please, because this is important. So make that big, would you please? Uh, this is courtesy of Captain Bill Pappas. He wrote an article for us a couple of years ago on how to catch these fish. And um, he's a Virginia Beach guy. Um, and you can see he's holding in his hand a big plug. And uh, he mentioned that he fishes these fish with those big plugs a lot. He trolls them. That's, that's kind of his item, you know, his lure of choice. And uh, you can also see in this picture, of course, this is a much bigger specimen. Uh, and this is down. He fishes out of, uh, I believe, Virginia Beach, uh, playing hooky charts. So if you want to go down there and uh, try for these guys, just go to uh, Google Play and Hooky Charters. You'll find them in no time, Virginia Beach. And uh, he does it to great effect with these plugs. Uh, in fact, go ahead and pop up the next one, Zach. Keep it big if you would, if you if you if you can swing that technical wonder. <clears throat> so that's that's another one of his pictures, and you can see that's quite a day with some much larger cutlass fish, much larger cutlass fish. Um, go ahead and take us to the next one, Zach. Let's talk a little bit about the where to, so folks can get a, a grip on where they might try this. So this is a blow up of a chart of an area very similar to where we were fishing. And I put the blue circle in there. 
the fish were not right on the drop off. They were just beyond the drop off in that kind of flat, deeper area. And that, that's a channel right there going uh, up, up in the lower Patuxent. And it really was flat bottom. Um, they were not, oh, wait a minute, Michael, sorry if you already stated, are you finding them in shallower, deep water moving or slower water? Okay, so it, it was this 10, 12, 14 foot depth range. Uh, they were kind of all in it. Like when you when you got away from it, we did try some other areas on the way out and on the way back. When you got away from it, you didn't catch them. Interestingly, we caught zero other species mixed in with them. No rockfish, no specks, um, no nothing, nothing else. Um, but again, they're, they're just kind of out in the middle of nowhere over these flat areas. They, they aren't around structure. And so, you know, you would think maybe you pick up a rock here and there, right? But you wouldn't expect to find big numbers of them just kind of milling around you know, in a channel. Um, and that's, that's kind of where these fish were. They were tightly schooled. Um, it took us maybe an hour and a half to really nail down the position of the school. And we caught maybe three fish throughout the course of that hour and a half. And then we figured out where they were and they were schooled big time. Once we found the school, we pounded on them. Um, I know I ended up cleaning 15 and we threw back a bunch. So, you know, they, they were hot and heavy once we located the school. Um, 15 was excessive. I got to say in retrospect, I, I wish I'd kept like eight or 10. Um, cleaning them is, is not a dream. <laughs> kind of a pain to clean them. They're long and skinny and they got a row of bones right down the middle and you have to cut along so first you cut out this long skinny fillet then you got to cut either side of the bone so you get two long skinnier fillets um you don't have to skin them they have no scales and the skin is basically tasteless you, you don't even notice it Look, seriously you don't even notice it so just leave the skin on there and i'm gonna say you know i did i new fish to me right i didn't know how to clean it so i googled it and I came up with a video by who but Captain Bill Pappas from Virginia Beach. <laughs> and I watched that video. And if you catch these fish and you want to take a moment and eat them, I suggest doing exactly the same thing because he's got it nailed down. I followed his process. It worked just fine. But again, 15, a little excessive. Um, I ended up cooking dinner for five and we had leftovers, plenty of leftovers. So, you know, maybe three of these fish is a meal for a person something along those lines, um, or less actually, because I did have leftovers. So maybe two, two for a person, uh, but they're good. They're good. It was good fish. So uh, sorry to chime in here, Lenny. Uh, I just wanted to say Seamus, actually another, someone else catching on the Severn. So. Oh my God, look at that. And he got it on the rattle trap. That's right. Yeah. So uh, Seamus, also, this goes in, in line with what you're discussing here. And I actually just looked up the E-Regs and I could not find the answer to this. But do you have any insight? As far as I know, and I have looked, there are no regs on ribbon fish in Maryland. They're, they're not listed. I did look. They're just not listed at all. Uh, they're not listed as ribbon fish. They're not listed as cutlass fish. They're not listed as belt fish. They're just not listed. Uh, and I'm sure that's because it's so new you know, for Maryland Wooders, you know, again, you know, Virginia, they get them or they have gotten them, but they've been just off the hook the last couple of years. Uh, Maryland, it's kind of a new one, you know? So I don't believe there's any sort of reg whatsoever. Uh, you want to throw up that next slide, Zach? This is a fun one. Sure thing. Uh, before we dive into the culinary arts, do you want to answer a few questions? Sure. Hit me. All right. So um, Mike had a follow up to just your targeting for depth. Assuming midwater or bottom oriented. Michael, I think I can answer that for you in maybe five years. Um, I, I can't tell you what exactly the fish were doing. It's too new to me, and I, I wish I knew more about it, but I just don't. However, we, we by far did best. When we let that jig hit the bottom, you had to wait. Wait for it to hit bottom. 12 feet of water, we're fishing like a half an ounce head. Wait for it to hit bottom. And then we lift the tip up so it came off the bottom and then just do a slow, steady retrieve. And that was the ticket. That really was the ticket. 
Um, I did vary the retrieve. I tried the surface. I tried a five count. I tried herky jerky. I tried all kinds of stuff, letting it hit the bottom. And then the slow steady was just, that was the magic. Um, and, and Eric was finding the same thing, but like I said, he did tell me that other times he's caught him up near the surface. So I guess if you're not catching, you might want to try a throw or two and just give it a couple of seconds to sink and then give it the retrieve. Um, you know, they're fish, fish do things differently on different days, but at least what we experienced last week, it was let it hit the bottom, slow retrieve coming back from there. All right. So, um, Todd has a question about retrieve as well. So kind of pop him up there. What was the retrieve of choice for jigs and what are some tips for setting the hook? So the, you know, that was the retrieve. We were using paddle tails. So you're going to get a good action with a paddle tail even when you're slow and steady, right? Paddle tail, that's one of the beautiful things about a paddle tail. You can hand it to anybody, and when they bring it through the water, that little tail is going to wiggle. That will give that fish some enticement. Um, now, as far as setting the hook goes, uh, that was one of the reasons why I wanted to play that video because I got that little clip of Eric, and he's like, oh, bite, nope, didn't make it. Oh, bite, nope, didn't get it. Um as soon as that you feel that fish hit, set the hook, and you're going to miss it a lot. Um, you know, a lot of fish with those sort of toothy mouths, um, they'll grab a fish anywhere they can. They aren't necessarily aiming for the head like a rockfish is to get it whole and suck it into their mouth and then crunch down on it. Um, it's more like a bluefish, right? A bluefish will segment those poor little bait fish in short order. Uh, and I got the feeling these things are hitting the same way. They're just grabbing it wherever they can from the side, front, back, doesn't matter, planting those teeth, and then they're going to eat the whole fish. Now, when they, when you felt the hit and you went to set the hook, I, I set the hook on every nip, as did Eric. Like I say, a lot of misses, but when you didn't miss, when you set the hook into the fish, it was like setting the hook into a brick wall. I mean, just full stop for whatever reason, whatever it is about the way they feed. Uh, you knew it. You, you totally knew it. Uh, and that lasted for a second or two. And then I guess they're trying to figure out what the heck is going on. And, and you got that free moment of reeling. So here's the critical thing. What I'm saying is critical about setting the hook. You set that hook, you feel that wall, and then the tension goes away. Reel, real fast. Make sure you maintain tension. Because chances are, you know, a couple seconds later, you're going to feel that tug, tug, tug. They got that backward swim motion. So, you know, a lot of times when you feel a hit and a miss, you're tempted to slow down, see if it'll come back. None of that. I think as soon as you feel that hit, you know, that solid, you, you got to reel. You got to keep it up because they'll fool you. They fooled me more than once into thinking they were off. Uh, I'll bet they fooled me five times into thinking they were off, and I, but I kept reeling, and then I'd feel that tug, tug, tug again. All right, so Lenny, um, Charlie over on YouTube has a question. Um, thoughts on trailer hooks for these short strikes? That's an interesting question, Charlie, but honestly, I don't think it'll do you a bit of good. I really don't, and the reason I say that is this spoon. It's got a treble in the tail end. I got hits and I got misses on this thing multiple times. Uh, again, with those teeth, a lot of fish, a lot, bleh, a lot of fish with teeth like that, really sharp or really gnarly teeth, they don't necessarily strike aft. They're gonna they're gonna chomp wherever they can. If they're over here and they see it coming and they're coming this way, they're just gonna chomp it right in the middle because they know that they got the teeth to kill that thing, right? And then they'll probably turn around and maybe try and grab you know from the back end or grab a bit or a piece they're probably used to cutting those fish in half like i said that spot was in three separate segments in that fish's belly no mistaking it you know it, it was it was a fresh kill uh it was very recognizable and you could very clearly see that the cutlass fish had bitten it into three pieces so having a trailer hook in the back i'm just not sure that's going to help much uh, one other thing I'll mention about that, when you when we pulled up after a bite and a miss, you'd have like a chunk here or a chunk here that was missing or that was slashed. 
Um, it, it's not like they were hitting back here and missing every time. Now you came out with plenty of tailless plastics, uh, but they also were biting all over this thing, just chewed all up. Uh, and often the tail would still be there, but it'd be chewed up up here. So I, I don't know. I, I don't, I'm not sure a trailer really would do a heck of a lot with them. All right, well, we got Charlie's attention. He, he was also curious about how they appear on sonar if they're vertically oriented. Well, I'm afraid that's a question I can't answer. Um, I did not have sonar. I was on the kayak. I've never been on a boat where we've looked at them on the meter and then caught them. So I just can't can't answer that. Um, I'll bet Bill could. And I, I apologize for my lack of info on this, but I don't want to tell you the wrong thing. I, I don't know. Well, I don't know. Jasper says they're wild looking on sonar. So, you know, <laughs> Come on, Jasper, give us give us some more. If you've seen these fish and you've caught them and you think you know, let come on, give us more. We want we want more intel here. Mm. I think you just uh, answered uh, these questions, uh, but but our friend Kevin was asking if you. Oh yeah, that's yeah. what Kevin. Hold on, where'd it go? I dropped it in the trash can. This bag was full. <laughs> When I left the dock, it was full. And uh, then it was empty. Yeah, there it is. I pulled up a whole lot of those. The bottom of the kayak was littered with uh, segmented plastics. All right. So um, let's see. I think we kind of already touched on this, but he, uh, Nolan might just be tuning in over on YouTube. You want to touch again on just uh, water depth? And he's also asking for trolling speed. Okay, so that's an interesting question. And we did not get into, into the trolling part yet. Uh, water depth, we were 10 to, 10 to 14 was kind of the sweet spot. Again, it was in a little bit of a channel, flat bottom, no structure. They just seem to be hovering out there. Uh, so ideal speed to troll is an interesting question because I did have good success trolling for him, and it was kayak trolling, right? Uh, Zach, you can probably give a lot of input here. I was paddling at like medium speed. I wasn't paddling hard. I wasn't silly easy. It was like a medium paddle on Eric's, um, uh, do you know what it's called? Uh, yeah, I think you were pedaling, right? Yes, correct. Yeah, so if you were probably doing about between two and three. Okay. It seemed like a, about walking speed. I mean, and that's three, right? So maybe I was doing a little less. I wasn't pedaling real hard, but that's a, is that, is, is that a native? Yeah. Uh, native Slayer Propel, I think Eric has. So uh, yeah, you, you're not going to be, you're two to five is really your speed range on that thing. So. And I wasn't going real hard. Yeah. So three is probably about right. And, and uh, it was very effective. I tried trolling a couple times. Uh, a couple of times we kind of lost the school and had to relocate them. And uh, I, I pitched out the jig, half ounce head. I also did troll. Oh, there's Eric. Thank you, Eric. Maybe 1.5. Okay, very good. And uh, I also did pull, um, Eric had a small spinnerbait, not much bigger than a perch pounder, uh, which he had had success on the previous week. And I did get bites on that. I did catch at least one or two trolling that, um, but then I hung it up because the paddle tail was doing better. Um, but but trolling those just the two, you know, one on either side of the kayak, uh, was quite effective. Okay. All right. Circle back on Kevin's. Uh, he was actually asking about your leader, not so much the soft plastic. Oh, oh, Kevin, I'm sorry. Uh, so interesting question. Uh, Shockingly, no, I never got bit off. Um, Eric, you've done more of this than I have. If you've been bitten off, would you would you chime in and let us know? Uh, but I had on my rod 20-pound fluoro, um, and I did not get bit off one single time. So Eric will let us know if, if that's normally a problem for him. Um, but I suspect not. I mean, we, we caught a bunch of these things, and it never happened. So while we wait for Eric to chime in, I'm dying to bring up the next slide, Zach. I'm just dying to. I get excited about this, okay? I guess I'm kind of like a fish foodie. And uh, I, I get really excited at the prospect of, like, trying a new fish. I mean, it just doesn't happen that often. 
And um, again, I followed uh, uh, Bill's advice on this with one exception, but he has, we got the slide, we got the picture. There it is. Make it big, make it big. Come on, make it big, man. So these little round, these are round ribbon fish roll-ups. And you got this long skinny fillet. So what you can do is you can roll it up and then stick a toothpick through it to hold it together and then bake it. But, 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 this is, this is Bill's advice here. And I'm saying this has got to be some good advice. Lay the filet out flat and then run some crab imperial down it, right? And then roll it up. So you got your crab layered in your pinwheel of cutlass fish. I mean, come on. How tasty can you get, right? Now, unfortunately, much to my dismay, I did not have any crab meat when I cooked these things. And so I thought, well, what, you know, man, what's the best way to cook these things? And if you Google it, there's actually a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, Asian recipes relating to cutlass fish. They're considered a delicacy in Asia. And most of them incorporate marinating the fillets in rice wine vinegar for about a half hour, 45 minutes, and then frying them with a very simple sparse breading. And uh, I could tell you one thing, if you do the marinating and then give them a little thin layer of panko and fry them up, they are quite tasty. And uh, every, everybody at the table agreed that they were quite tasty. Um, again, don't worry about the skin. You can even see in those pinwheels, the skin is on the fish. It's basically tasteless. It does help hold the meat together and they don't have scales. So there's no, no problem with it. You don't have to worry about skinning them or getting rid of that skin. Um, and in fact, if you take the knife and rub it down the fillets, the skin kind of just like, it, it's, it's very, um, what's the right word? Weak is the wrong word. There's just not much to it. Um, there's not much there. So don't even worry about it. And if you can get some crab imperial, mm, now nah, you're talking. All right. We have any more questions, Zach? Um, yeah, we do have a couple. Um, I saw one from earlier, and it was from... Let's see. Steve Morgan asked... Um, do they chase other species out of the area? Hmm. Well, hmm. I am not a biologist, and I can't accurately answer that. Um, what I can tell you is where we were fishing was not really a zone where I would expect to catch many other fish. Um, you know, if, if I'm going for rockfish or I'm looking for specks, I want a point, structure, current, tide, something like that. And we were just kind of out in the channel and uh you know there's not a lot of tide there there's not a lot of not a lot of water moving a little bit you know but not not much and it's not it's just not an area i would expect to find a whole lot of other fish although i go back to the spot in the belly of the one um that is the kind of area you might put down a bottom rig with bloodworms to catch some spot so i'm pretty darn sure that the little spot and the little crooker probably are too psyched that they're around. But uh, beyond that, I, I, you know, not to my knowledge. Um, let's, let's put up that last slide, Zach, and let's make it big because this, I mean, it's a killer picture and it just really kind of says it all about these fish. It is certainly their most prominent feature. I mean, look at those teeth. They are gnarly. Um, they're also barbed. It, I don't know if you can really see well, you know, in, in this shot, on this picture, they're actually barbed. So, like, don't put your fingers near near those guys. You know, keep your fingers away from those mouths. If that tooth goes in, it's going to be painful coming out. It's going to be really painful. Regarding uh, leader bite-offs earlier, Eric had said uh, very few leader bite-offs. Interesting. So that is interesting, isn't it? So what does that tell you? I'm going to surmise a little bit, which I normally don't really like to do when I'm talking fish and I like to talk about what I know about. I don't like to guess and I don't like to predict, but, but 
that makes a little bit of a light bulb go off in my brain and say, these fish, they're not at all feeding like a rockfish would, where they're targeting the eyes, they're targeting the head, trying to suck it in. That tells me that these fish are doing, actually, um, I hate to make a guess, but I think it's a good guess. That tells me that these fish are probably feeding, you know, more like a bluefish or a mackerel. They're just going for the chop. That's it. Bite. And then they're going to come around and eat them up again. So that that actually, that's interesting. Uh, what do we got here? Jake says, caught them out of Oregon Inlet a couple years back on the same rigs and speed that you would troll for mackerel up there. So, Jake, I want to ask you an important question. Which species of mackerel? Because if you're fishing, if you're trolling for king mackerel, you might be using these guys for bait, and you're probably trolling, trolling slow. But if you're trolling for Spanish mackerel, you're trolling fast. So uh, which which mackerel, and where are you going fast or slow? Come on back to us, Jake. Come on back to us. I want to know. Inquiring minds want to know. Meanwhile, all right. Um, in regards to the question about um, chasing other species, Eric said he caught some blood worms in that location. So, so that makes perfect sense. So. That spot was in three pieces. He was not a happy camper. He was done. Um, we touched on this before, but Ed wants to know how far up the bay can you find them? Oh, so Ed, five years ago, I would have said, um, you know, like maybe Wolf Trap, Virginia. <laughs> but in the last couple of years, the Patuxent and the Chop Tank, they've been coming to steady the last couple of years. And this year, the Severn, they've been up as far as the Severn. I haven't heard of them north of the Severn yet, but Zach, what was that count up to? Like 11 now? Yeah. That we know of? So right, I, right guarantee, I guarantee you, if 11 have been caught in the Severn, they're a little bit farther north too. They're going to pop up somewhere else. Someone's going to catch one near the bridge or in the Magathy or something. Because 11, that's a lot. And we've heard about all these, what, in the last two weeks maybe? Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, you know, I should also mention, uh, so – not this past week, but the week before, we had a report of four that were caught trolling for Spanish mackerel off Chesapeake Beach, and one that was caught on a jig, uh, also near North Beach, and at least a couple from the chop tank by people throwing jigs. So they're, you know, they're around. They're around. They're out there. Uh, um, Jake has um, answered your Five or six, exactly. I would troll for Spanish in the Bay. Okay. Um, uh, thank you, Jake. That's cool. Um, I I would point out that if you want to troll for Spanish in the Bay, you should do max speed, right? <laughs> I don't I don't have the I don't have the uh, formula at my fingertips, but uh, Walt, our friend Walt, has a fantastic formula. Look at Zach going crazy with the Google. He's going to bring it right up. Uh, Walt has a mathematical calculation depending on water temperature that tells you the the best speed to troll for spanish in the bay and lo and behold it works it absolutely works um walt's got a big engineer brain and he figured it out here it comes there it is max speed um i can't see it zach can you tell us the formula can you see can you read it out Uh, max speed is 8.1 miles per hour, I believe. Well, it's based well, on... That's the, the example. Yes. That's the example. Where's the formula? Uh, you know, I'm not good on all this math here, but you know what? I'm going to put it up. Maybe people can... Uh... It's like water temperature minus 10 times something. Uh, it's on the website. It's on the website. And uh, the formula works. It totally works. I want to say it's water temperature minus 10 times 0. 0.5. I'm probably wrong. I should shut my mouth. I'm no good with math. Uh, but max speed is on there, and it does work in the bay. Well, we got any other questions up? Uh, we sure do. Um, Walt asks, is this another invasive species? I don't think you can call it invasive because it wasn't transplanted here. They just started coming. 
uh, and they have been off the coast of Ocean City before. They've, they've been in the bay. They normally just don't come this far north. Um, you know, you know, the Virginia Beach guys are used to seeing them. Uh, certainly not in the numbers they've been in. There's certainly a population boom going on. But I don't think we can call them invasive. It's not like they came from Africa or something. You know, they're, they're Atlantic fish. They're, they're, they've always been along the Atlantic seaboard. So, you know, they're, they're just expanding their range, I guess, which is not unusual. I mean, look, if you wanted to make the argument that they're invasive, you'd also have to make the argument that, like, cobia are invasive, right? Because they've always been around, and they've always been in Maryland waters, but they've been going farther north than ever before in recent years. So, you know, a little, little bit of a slippery slip, I think, to call them invasive. I wouldn't use that word. Um, but they certainly are um, booming. They're, they're enjoying a population boom, and it is taking them to places that we're not used to seeing them. Um, you know, we could throw climate change into the conversation. I don't know. Again, I'm not a scientist, but we have been seeing all kinds of weird stuff. I mean, last year, a smooth puffer fish was caught at Belvedere Shoals. We have photographic evidence, a smooth puffer, not a normal blowfish. This is the smooth puffer is actually the poisonous kind. I'd never heard of one in the Bay of my life until last, uh, I think it was September, uh, and a reader sent in a photo. Uh, specs, we got specs all over the place this year. Um, <laughs> uh, one of my sons was on a boat that got four in the Severn last week, um, small ones, but they were specs, and I've had good days at Poplar this year. Uh, one of the specs, bigger specs, 18, 19, 20 inches. Um, you know, everything is just shifting around a little bit. We had a report of, uh, what was it, Zach? Three redfish, three bull reds north of Poplar? Yes, that was just a few days ago. Right. Uh, and they were bulls. They were big reds that normally you'd be looking for farther south. What were they doing north of Poplar? I don't know. But, you know, they're fish. They got tails. <laughs> they can do what they want to do. And if they can find bait, they're going to move around. I remember when I was a kid, we didn't have blue uh, rockfish. We called bluefish all the way up at Love Point. Six, eight, ten pound bluefish were not uncommon at Love Point. So, you know, things change. Uh, is there a time here that's prime for them? Well, uh, Daryl, I don't want to stake my reputation on this because, you know, this is a new thing to me, right? I'm, I'm no cutlass fish sharpie. Uh, however, I do know um, from all the reports we're constantly getting, that they arrive, you know, late spring, early summer down the bay. They get up our way early midsummer, and they stick around till early fall. I, I, they seem you seem to stop hear about uh, hearing about them about the same time as the mackerel. If you get a couple cold fronts push through, and the water temperatures in the bay undergo a significant drop in a short period of time, usually happens late September. You stop hearing about them. Eric, if you're still on, if you would chime in and let us know how late you've caught them or if you've known, uh, noticed a time frame when they disappear. That Oh, here we go. Uh, August and September. Okay. August and September. So we're talking the hot months. Thanks for that, Eric. <clears throat> we got any other questions in the queue, Zach? Um, Daryl also had a question uh, about an article you read. I don't see a reference here um, uh, about uh, forever chemicals being found at military sites in the Chesapeake Bay. Yeah, I, I saw that today, too. Uh, any comment? Here's my comment. Um, in my short lifetime, I have watched the bay get better and better and better water quality and then get worse and worse and worse. In the late 90s, early 2000s, man, I was so happy. It seemed like the bay was just getting better and better and better. And then we had a few springs with heavy rainfall, and it just, um, you can, you know, look at the rockfish population. We had the uh, July closure this year. Everybody thought, well, everybody, a lot of people thought maybe that'll, you know, reduce the number of dead fish floating around. Uh, it did not. Right through the closure, we had rockfish, keeper-sized rockfish, 
floating around dead like crazy on top of the dead carp, on top of the dead catfish. Bottom line, there are extraordinarily serious water quality issues going on in the bay right now. Um, it was better at one time. Um, then it, it was better than it was when I was a kid. That's no longer true. It's now worse. And uh, that's just one more, one more item to add to the list. Uh, but the unfortunate fact of the matter is until the political types get serious, it isn't going to change. Whether you're talking about the toxins, the, they call them the forever toxins. What he's referring to uh, was the, uh, I forget the acronym. It's the, the foams that are used in firefighting um, that were, they, they verified their presence. And I think it was nine sites along the bay, both Maryland and Virginia, all military sites because the military uses this foam to put out jet fuel. Um, Is that the PCBs? It's not PCBs. There's an extra letter. There are four letters. Uh, there are four letters in this one. The PCBs is another one. It's another one. And this is why, you know, uh, some of you who follow Fish Talk may have noticed that about a week ago, uh, I posted an article in our news section online. It wasn't in print because I wanted to do it immediately about the, um, the, the bill currently making its way through Congress, the infrastructure bill. My take on it is if you give a dang about the Bay, you got to be for this infrastructure bill because they are putting a bunch of cash towards cleaning up the Bay. Um, it, it's in excess of the funds that were dedicated to the Bay previously. It's like another 40, 50 million. Um, and I know everybody's got their own takes on politics, blah, blah, blah. But the bottom line is what I've seen is if you don't vote the bay, if you don't support the laws that directly affect the bay because of other considerations, the bay doesn't get squat. And I'm not going to go on a big political diatribe here. You know, politics is not my business. Fish is my business. But it drastically affects the fishing. We all know that the decisions the politicians make, do, it does drastically affect the fish, the fishing, the water quality. And what I've seen is I, I've tried to be a responsible voter and not base my decisions solely on the bay and positions on the bay. And I've come to regret it. I've come to regret it because what happens is when a politician doesn't make very direct, very strong promises with regards to the bay and the fisheries, and they just, you know, maybe give it a little lip service. What that means is, frankly, they don't give a damn. They don't. Um, it's only the ones who come out really, really strongly and make really, really strong promises in favor of the Bay. Th they're the only ones that ever do anything about it. Uh, you know, we all take everything the politicians say with a grain of salt. But when they just pay a lip service, you can bet that means absolutely nothing. That means we're not giving the, we're not doing nothing about that. So, I don't know. Shouldn't even talk politics. Probably a bad idea, right? Something I shouldn't even do. Um, but, you know, that bill had an awful lot of funding going towards cleaning up the bag. And um, you know what? Forget the rest of it. I'm going to support that. Sorry. Sorry for the diatribe. I apologize, people. We got any other questions there, Zach? Um, just a couple people chiming in about the uh, aqueous film forming foam. Is that it? That's it. I knew there were four letters. I yeah. knew it. And someone else, uh, Daryl says the PFAS. I'm not sure what that acronym is for. But, uh, yeah, I don't know what it's for either, but I saw that in the article. In the article and, I read. Uh, Wayne suggesting his UXO chapter in his book, Chesapeake Bay Fisher Reefs. Huh. Which um, might be a good time to uh, draw our winner. Ooh, somebody's going to win. So where did I put the book? I lost my copy. There it is. Book, line, and slinker. There it is, people. So I put uh, all the commenters in a random generator here, and the winner is Daryl. Daryl Leha. Ah, there you go, Daryl. So uh, Daryl, shoot us a comment, and uh, we'll figure out how to get you Wayne's new book. 
Yeah, I, I think the way we've done it in the past is, Daryl, if you PM Fish Talk Mag uh, on Facebook, and then we can get your address and uh, get the book in the mail to you. Congrats. Very good. Um, uh, you have to forgive me. I forgot to put up a um, very important information earlier. So if you want to tell uh, folks about our Fishing for Beginner section and our specific ribbon fish article. Absolutely. We do have a Fishing for Beginners article in ribbon fish. I went back and read it myself before I went down and joined Eric. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of new folks out there fishing. There really are. The whole COVID thing uh, got a lot more people outdoors. And fortunately, it got a lot of new people fishing. And uh, if any of you folks who've just started fishing or watching, we at Fish Talk want to welcome you with open arms. We love it. Um, you know, it's an experience that we want to share with the world. And we're, we're glad to see you get into fishing. And we do have an entire section on the site uh, dedicated just a very super basic beginner articles. They're really for people who have never fished for a particular species before. They've never fished for speckled sea trout and they want to give it a try. It's the very basics. Uh, every month in the magazine, we, we run a new article and then it goes up on the website. And, uh, and we've been doing it for a while now. So we have quite a few Fishing for Beginners articles on there. And I think we're going to expand that to include tactics. I think it's time. We've covered a lot of the basic species. I think it's time to start doing some really basic articles on just your, you know, how to retrieve a jig, how to, how to troll with spoons, how to troll with planers, stuff like that. Just get some real basic info out there. Because, you know, if you didn't grow up fishing and you just tried it and you, you love it and you're getting into it, sometimes that really basic stuff, you just, you know, have that foundational knowledge and uh, it can come back to really bite you. Um, you know, the simplest thing can make it really tough to catch a fish. The simplest little thing that most of us would take for granted. You know, I, I want my latest book is Mistakes Anglers Make. And this this is I'm going to use this example because it always jumps out at me. Um, let's say you go fishing and you're getting bitten by mosquitoes and you take out your bug repellent, you spritz, 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 you rub it all over. Then you pick up your fishing rod, you put your lure on it and you cast. You're not going to catch a fish. Uh, the active ingredient in bug repellent is DEET. There is one proven fish repellent out there, and guess what it is? DEET. And uh, experiments have been done. You put one drop of DEET into a massive fish tank, and all the fish, all the fish will immediately go to the other end of the fish tank and cower in a corner. They hate this stuff every bit as much as bugs do. And you might have the best fishing boat in the world and the best lure in the world and the best rod in the world and the best reel in the world, the best line in the world, and you're casting out that lure with all your cool equipment and you're bringing it back just right in the perfect way to catch a fish, but you got deed on that thing, you're not going to catch it. And so it's sometimes the simplest little minimal factors that we might not even think about um, sabotage us. So I think it's really important to, that, that people who maybe didn't grow up fishing, they, they got to get that basic knowledge. So uh, I think I went off on another diatribe there, but uh, whatever. It's, it's, kind of, it's kind of an important topic, right? So uh, you folks who are new, stay tuned. Those beginner's articles are going to keep rolling out. And you old timers, you know, hey, maybe you want to skip over them. Maybe you'll read them and, you know, a light bulb will go off and you go, oh, man, that's something I didn't know. I don't know. Woo. Well, Zach, if we don't have any new questions, I think we have reached the end of this road. Yep, I think that's about it. Um, looks like we covered all our bases here. So uh, thanks for everyone for tuning in. Just want to take another moment to thank our sponsor for tonight's episode, and that's Curtis Stokes. If you're looking for a fish boat, big or small, they got them all. CurtisStokes.net. And... Uh, Second Thursday of the month, Lenny. Is that about next yep. month, September? Yep. We'll be back the second Thursday of the month. And uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We appreciate it. We hope it went well and you learned something. And uh, 
you know, you, if you come up with a question an hour from now, you can plug it into the comments, and I will try and go back and make sure I field all of those questions. And in the meantime, wait, 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 wait. We have some big news. Zach, you want to tell him? I know, Zach's like, what is he talking about? The newest edition of Fish Talk, the September edition, goes to the printer tomorrow and will be on the shelves in all the tackle shops, all the, the liquor stores, grocery stores, everywhere you find Fish Talk. They will be on the shelves in, what, about maybe eight days from now? Is that about right? Uh, next weekend. So next next weekend. weekend. So keep your eyes peeled, people. September is coming. Awesome. Thank you, Lenny. Thank you, Zach. Have a good one, everybody. See ya.